Women's and Gender Studies are a unique interdisciplinary programs which are undergoing transformation. Their development is according to social movements and constant academic transformations. Women's Studies has its roots and origins in the social movements of the 1960s and 70s, specifically the civil rights and the women's movements. These programs were born largely due to the students' and teachers' activism and demand. During the spring of 1989, six women faculty from three different departments initiated conversations about a women's studies minor at Keene State College. These three departments met to discuss their common desire for a women's studies program and their commitment to creating one. Women's Studies at Keene State College is an interdisciplinary program that explores from a feminist perspective the contribution, ideas, and experiences of women in all areas of society, including age, sexual preference, race, ethnicity, and social class. From 1989 to 1990, more faculty joined this effort of building a women's studies program. President Judith Sternick supported the program and an administrative supervisors team was established. The women's studies minor was approved in the spring of 1992 and in the spring of 1994 graduated its first two students with minors in women's studies. Thank you, Patricia, for <laughs> inviting me. Good to see you, Karen. Yeah. Um, I'm Patrice Stryford, and I, at, when I first came to Keene State, I worked as the associate director of the Student Center. And my background is in student affairs. And so for, for many years, I worked in student affairs here, and it was because of actually the work of the Feminist Collective that we began to really collaborate more with student affairs and academic affairs. And I don't remember what year it was, but there was a time where I got invited to be on the Women's Studies Council. And as a student affairs professional, it opened up a whole new connection to faculty and staff. And there became a lot of energy. There was always a lot of energy, but I think what happened in the classroom then became part of that advocacy work in the, in the uh, community. Tell me how sure. you started, uh, how you were motivated to travel to Mexico with the students. I know that um, I was really excited about the idea of developing a, a travel course where we would take students to Mexico, a women's studies travel course to Mexico so we could learn about the lives of women in other countries. Mexico's our bordering neighbor country and like instead of reading about it in books, like, let's go there, <laughs> let's actually visit. So then I thought, well, I need colleagues, you know, and so we got Jo Beth Mullins, who was a professor mm -hmm. in geography at the time, and also very interested in regional, you know, coursework with students, and they, the geography department did trips all of the time. And so, like, Jo Beth, and then, but let's get Patrice. So, and it was the first time we kind of had this, like, three professor, you know, student collaboration, affairs, academic student affairs. affairs, academic affairs, exactly, collaborative, let's teach this class, let's get the students, and 
and we we got to we cobbled together students. I don't even remember how, but how many do we take? Six twenty seven. Twenty. Oh my God. Twenty seven. Yes, seven. Twenty seven <laughs> students. Yeah. The next well, we go. think we didn't turn anybody away <laughs> because we were so excited. We were so excited, and so we put together a budget for it. We probably got funding. It was easier again to talk to the administration and say we have this really great idea, and they'd be supportive of it. They love the collaborative part of it, and so. We put together the program. We made, con because of your connections, asking for your help, you connect connected us with um, Ceci and Marie from, um, what was the name of that organization? The there was an organization of Franciscan sisters right. in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. And they, w they had a center. So I, I, I worked in Mexico with several organizations, yeah. but with them, uh, we did the spirituality and education and women's lives. Right, and because they had a program there already, they had housing, they had sort of dormitory style set up, they had a dining hall, so that you could go and that and this organization, um, which was based in Mexico, for visitors to come to and learn about Mexico, we asked them to tailor the program about studying the lives of women, women in Mexico. It was women's roles. I think women's roles in Mexico. Exactly. And so we we um, had them yeah. set us up with visiting women in healthcare, women in the environmental movement, women doing like social work kind of social justice work. And we visited different towns. We looked at some of the political struggles that women were having. So we traveled in places in Mexico that weren't your normal tourist track. Right, and you helped us figure out some of those locations, and Ceci and Marie helped us figure out some of those locations. And um, but it just kind of it just kind of came out of the desire of those of us that were on the faculty to bring this experience to students, and the and it was not that difficult to pull it together in those days. In 2010, Women's Studies submitted the proposal and got approval for a new Women's and Gender Studies major and minor. The new major included a commitment to transnational, intersectional, feminist, queer, interdisciplinary curriculum and pedagogy. In the fall of 2011, the new department was integrated with tenure track positions that included four core faculty and four adjunct faculty. time I'm dreaming that I'm sharing with the students what that means uh, to form a program. And so clearly this program uh, has requested the investment and hours and hours and meetings and meetings of the work of many, many uh, people, many faculty, staff, students at King State College. And uh, one specific information about um, passing from a minor to a major uh, in the time, I'm talking about probably 2008, 2009, 2010, um, there was necessary to do a lot of research uh, about what uh, was the context of proposing a major, the Women's Studies Council and the women, um, ma women Studies minor, Women Gender Studies is interdisciplinary itself all the time, and the joining of faculty from diverse uh, disciplines or expertise, uh, it is a normal practice, a daily routine in this kind of program. Currently, the Women's and Gender Studies program has a number of professors from various departments teaching elective courses for WGS. One of the, the sort of many things that we do in literary studies is there are a variety of, of theoretical approaches that you can take in literary studies. Um, and that's part of what we teach is that there are 
multiple ways to interpret a text. There are sort of multiple schools of thought, we could say, about how to interpret a text. Um, and one of those ways is through the lens of women's and gender studies. And so um, what's really interesting for me as somebody who has a lot of WGS students, in, especially in my cross-listed classes, is that those students come in already with that theoretical background. Um, so they are really able to hit the ground running in terms of literary analysis. Um, and they're very comfortable with bringing a variety of theoretical approaches to literary studies. Um, so whether we're doing what's called close reading or new historicism or a post-colonial interpretation or a feminist interpretation or a queer studies interpretation or deconstructionism or, you know, any of these schools of, of literary um, theory, the WGS students are, are right there prepared to do it and to transfer it, you know, not only from literature, but also to cultural production more broadly. Um, so I think that can be such a valuable part of um, of having WGS students in the room. And it's so it's so wonderful for how that helps other students um, as well, because, you know, some of those theoretical approaches are, are thorny and complicated and, and really difficult. Um, but you know, working, working together as, as a classroom, um, we can really like kind of get into some really interesting discussions together. When I was an undergraduate, I remember discovering women writers and it was like my whole life changed. Um, I had been very committed to the classics and I really didn't even know that there was such a thing called women's writing or that um, there would be such a thing as women's history. And those ideas have come to really shape my work. Um, right now I'm working on a documentary film about the women um, who served as nurses in World War I. And I'm reconstructing their diary entries and putting it to archival work to try to reconstruct their experiences because there are no images of their experiences on film, really except the propaganda videos that can be found at the National Archives. It took me a whole summer to research African-American nurses because they were even more absent from the record. So what I've learned is that our very, ba our very conception of history and everyday life has been shaped by certain assumptions that aren't really true. That is really what drew me to women's studies. That and I do identify as a feminist scholar. It's always been very important to me. And so um, my teaching is really based in a study of film, um, a study of film technology and history, but it's also based in trying to understand the relationship between film and gender. And so I guess that interdisciplinary convergence is what brought me to the Women and Gender Studies program. And I'm very proud to um, every other year teach women in cinema. Um, I share it with another uh, faculty member here in film. Um, and so I feel that that's a very important contribution to the film curriculum and to the women's studies curriculum. Um, and I'm really committed to um, that work. I have been working to try to make sure that my classes are inclusive from the moment that I started teaching. So when I started teaching, the first year I taught here, I taught a just straight up Western Civ class. And I couldn't stand it. I, so I, 
Um, I developed a class called Marriage and Family in Western Civilization, which teaches Western Civilization, but through the lens of marriage and family, so that you have a natural way of bringing both sexes into the conversation. And talk, because, you know, in ancient societies, your family was part of the political structure, right? And so the and families and political structures were intimately tied. That's true for the Middle Ages, but it's also true for the ancient world as well. And um, so from the very beginning that I started teaching, I've been trying to include um, women and issues, not just because in uh, marriage and family, of course, I'm dealing with sexuality too, um, because that's part of the process, right? And so um, I, and so, and I early on also developed my history of sexuality class, again, to meet a need in terms of, you know, helping, you know, or allowing students to see what they have in the past. For one thing, it puts to bed the notion that, you know, the medieval, medieval Europe was all white, right? Which is nonsense. It never, that notion was never correct. But a lot of people buy into that. And it also is, gives refuge to white supremacists who think that the Middle Ages is some sort of, you know, white golden age when that's not a, at all what it is, right? And so, so studying, you know, the development of constructs of race in the Middle Ages helps also to uh, helps us to also to understand why there is no such thing as a white golden age. In 2015, a new position was granted, bringing Dr. Tanim Hussein to the Women's and Gender Studies Department. So WGS is a small department, so I kind of teach everything. <laughs> um, so it runs the gamut from, you know, thinking about critical ethnic studies, which is a class I'm teaching this semester. I'm teaching Islam, media, and politics this semester. But the way that we think about WGS, I think, is sort of the study of identity and difference. So um, our classes cover a wide variety of things. Um, so those are two examples, but I think, you know, we teach, or I teach stuff like gender, race, and sexuality in pop culture, transnational feminisms. Um, I teach a lot of different things. <laughs> So I think the way that I try to explain intersectionality to my students is that it's sort of twofold. One is thinking about the ways that our identities intersect, right? The ways that, you know, being someone who is a raced body, a gendered body, um, how those different identities intersect with each other. But then the other component of intersectionality is how structures of power see us, systems of power see us when we are at a variety of those different different kinds of intersections. So because of that, right, thinking about how identities intersect and how systems of power see us, I think the most important thing in any of those classes is centering marginalized knowledges and making sure that marginalized knowledges from a variety of different intersections are at the core of um, those classes. So I think that in terms of changes I've seen over the course of my career, I've in WGS, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, and I think that ultimately what the changes relate to are the ebbs and flows in terms of politics and in terms of culture, right? Our politics shift and change based on what is important at the day, which has to do, you know, with people in power. It also has to do with what people in general are asking for and need. And as a result of that, our understandings of what's important in a field like WGS shift and change. So, for example, before I came here, we didn't have a transnational studies um, class. But the way that our world is global now, much more global than it was even 10 years ago, um, requires that we study gender and sexuality and race through that lens, right? We have to look at things not just centered here in the United States, but globally. So I think that it's about looking at what we as a culture are focusing on and assuring that we're bringing a lens of identity of gender, race, and sexuality to those um, subjects. So I think of an inclusive curriculum as centering marginalized knowledge, right? Marginalized people 
are generally not thought about in terms of curriculum. And if we're going to declare ourselves inclusive in terms of any kind of curriculum, then they need to be at the forefront of um, what we're teaching and what we're learning. So I think centering marginalized people and marginalized knowledges is necessary. So of course, everyone at Keene State deserves an inclusive curriculum. Um, we all deserve to, to learn knowledge as it's seen from a variety of lenses. Um, and so I hope an, our inclusive curriculum can do that. Thank you.